For the third year and counting, Richard Skipper has been celebrating the artists you love. And what are some of the things that you've really run out of time? And, I, and we've got to talk about your latest. I want to go back a little bit, first of all, and celebrate a true legend. Richard Skipper is all about celebrating life, art, and his guest body of work. And did you pursue performing opportunities while you were in high school? Please join us while he showcases these diverse and talented individuals. Here's, Here's Richard, Richard Skipper. Skipper. Happy Thursday, everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of Richard Skipper Celebrates. Who or what are you celebrating today? Well, I'm celebrating the fact that it's Thursday. Uh, it's a new month, uh, pretty much so. Uh, we're careening towards the weekend. Uh, it's Oscar month. Uh, we're heading towards the Oscars. And all this month, Turner Classic Movies is celebrating uh, Oscar favorites. Uh, tonight at 8 o'clock, The Apartment is on, which is one of my favorite movies. And I can't think of a better guest uh, to have on our show today than that tired old queen from the movies himself, Steve Hayes, <laughs> who we uh, sat down and did this at the beginning of COVID. Uh, it was not the cleanest show, and I don't mean in that direction. I mean because I was just getting started with this, and there were all kinds of technical issues. But I asked him back. He is here. And before we start, I want to ask you, uh, Steve, who or what are you celebrating today? Oh, uh, what am I I'm Well, I'm celebrating the fact that I'm doing a show at Pangea, which is my first show that I've done in two years. I'll be there at uh, Pangea on April the 10th at 7 o'clock, and I'm doing my one-man show where I play Alfred Hitchcock. It's called Steve Hayes uh, with a Hitch. There it is on the screen. And, yes, and I only got to do it once uh, before uh, we went into lockdown. So I'm very excited to, to bring back Mr. Hitchcock and do it again. Yeah. Oh, I, well, I want to tell you, I mean, Tired Old Queen at the Movies is one of my favorite pastimes. But once I get started, I go down the rabbit hole and I can't stop. Oh, I, just watch, yes. I just watch one after the next. Uh, and a lot of times I have to say they're more in entertaining than some of the movies that you talk about. Oh, I'll about. give you an hour to cut that out. <laughs> <laughs> I want to ask you, I'm going to put you on the spot. Good. Uh, tonight. The Apartment is on. Have you done one about The Apartment? Oh, yes. Yes, I did uh, The Apartment. So, I love The Apartment. Shirley MacLaine breaks my heart in that movie. She's so good. There was a Early in her career, she was that pixie person with the heart on her sleeve. You know, she wasn't tough. She was just, she had been through the mill. You know what I mean? She was, she played those characters. Some came running in The Apartment and Career. Those were those kind of roles. And nobody did it better. You know, the, the I think the secret to a lot of these stars is that they created their own type. And that was her forte. That was her type that got her in, you know. Uh, right, she, her first movie was a Hitchcock movie. It was, it That's was right. Trouble with Harry. And, um, and yeah, I love the apartment. And I love it. I love it because it's New York at that certain time. You know, it's around the same time as How to Succeed in Business and, you know, um, uh, Mad Men, and I love that period so much. And Billy Wilder, I mean, oh, and Billy, it's Billy Wilder, ILA Diamond, that combination, you know, that some like it hot, the apartment, Irma LaDuce, you know, they, they were really, they were at the top of their game at that time, and, um, you know, the only reason some like it hot didn't sweep the Oscars the year before is because the Ben Hur, Ben Hur rode Charlton rode the chariot in and walked away. They walked away with everything, but uh, I love the apartment. I think it's a great movie. Great. I'll share a very interesting story about Shirley MacLaine. Uh, years, years ago, I was invited to a dinner party at Bob Randall's apartment, you know, and uh, Bob Randall wrote The Fan. Have you ever read The Fan, by the way? I, yes. As a matter of fact, I read The Fan when it first came out and thought it would be a great movie. And I got the DVD for Christmas this year. Oh. Yeah. Well, the, when the fan came out, uh, I think that you and I are probably in the same age range. I may be older than you. <laughs> I'm at home on the range. How about you? <laughs> <laughs> but when the fan came out, I was in high school uh -huh. and I found this book and I became a fan of the fan. Yeah. And for those of you who have not read the book, it is such an incredible book 
because it's all written as letters. Correspondence. Yes. It, it, it's correspondence. Whole thing. And I could not put this book down. And I imagined the entire, I cast, as I do with a lot of books uh, that I'm reading, I cast the entire movie in my head. And so I'm reading the book. And of course, it's a, a 1940s movie star who has made a Broadway comeback uh, in a Broadway musical. Who does it sound like? Lauren McCall. Mm -hmm. And I immediately cast Lauren McCall in the movie. And this was before uh, the movie had even been even thought of. The book had just come out. So years later, I am at this dinner party and I am sitting in this gorgeous uh, dining room. And I look up on the shelf and there's the fan in every language known to man. And I said to the host, well, I guess you're a fan of the fan. And my date is kicking me under the table because Bob Randall had written the book. And Bob Randall, uh, and luckily I had read the book. I was a fan of the book and I was able to talk about the book knowing what I was talking about. And I told him how much I loved the book and how much I loved Laura McCall in the movie. And he said, with all due respect, he did not like Laura McCall in the movie. And he said that he had gotten a call from Shirley MacLaine and Shirley MacLaine said, I want to do this movie. Oh. And he told Shirley MacLaine at the time, you are all wrong for this movie. And he didn't think that she had what it took to play this role. And she said, I want to take you to lunch and I want to convince you otherwise. And she took, he said, you can take me to lunch, but I am, you're not going to convince me otherwise. She took him to lunch at uh, Tavern on the Green and uh, they had this wonderful long afternoon and uh, he just could not be convinced that she was right. He said when he went to see Terms of Endearment, he kicked himself all the way home. He uh, because yeah. this was before Terms of Endearment. Yeah, of course it does. yeah. And he cool. didn't think that she was the right person for it. Yeah, and it was before. It was just not too long, but maybe five or six years before Turning Point, where she had another boost out, a boost in. She was a terrific actress. She was terrific. And I my, I thought that that movie, um, uh, you know, they the legitimate talk about it, uh, in the extras on the DVD, and I agreed with it, was was that it went from being a suspense movie, which is what it was, to a slasher picture. And that yes. really didn't work as it. it wasn't a slasher movie. You know, it wasn't like, you know, uh, you know, those psycho movies. It wasn't like Halloween. It was a suspense film. And Lauren McCall, I guess, was a piece of work to work with. I loved Michael Bean. I thought Michael Bean was great. He was hot and gorgeous and he had he was sinister. He was really good and I thought Maureen was terrific. In oh too. my god. Well, I this movie came out around the time that I I mean it was shortly after I had come to New York. I was a young gay man in New York and there's a scene in the movie that take that was shot at the Haymarket. Mm -hmm. Did you ever go to the Haymarket? Oh sure. Sure. I never I them all, honey. I was at all of them. <laughs> I, I chew never, hay at the hay market. What was that? I said I chew hay at the hay market. I never went back after I saw that movie. <laughs> no, I made you know I you know I I I, I made the rounds. You know I yeah, certainly did. Yeah. And it was that time. It was a great time to be in New York. You know the early seventies and your twenties. You know. Absolutely. Well, Shirley MacLaine, speaking of her, she was one of those actresses that every time a movie came out that she was in, I made it a point of going to the movies the, the day it opened. Uh, and in those days of going when it was a single movie theater, as opposed to the cineplexes, which I miss uh, those days, standing in line, knowing the people that you're standing in line with, uh, going into the movies and it being that one singular film. Uh, I miss those days. Who were the actresses or actors that you, when a film opened, you made a point of making sure that on that opening day you went to see their films? Well, uh, you know, because I was in my, you know, I, I graduated high school in 71 and I was in my 20s in New York. Um, Glenda Jackson. Glenda Jackson knocked me out. 
That was the great time of those British actresses that came into being. Glenda Jackson won two Oscars right away. Vanessa Redgrave was doing Mary Queen of Scots and Isadora. Maggie Smith, the prime of Miss Jean Brody, Travels with My Aunt. All those, uh, any of those Brit actresses, I was geared right into. So I went to see those. I loved Jane Fonda. I went and heard, saw her when she was Hanoi Jane at Syracuse when I was upstate living, you know, because mm -hmm. I was from upstate New York near Syracuse. So I went and saw her talk against the war and I, I loved her. Um, I I really loved, uh, I loved Liza. Oh my God. I loved Liza Minnelli in Cabaret. I, and, and Stero Cuckoo was shot only 10 miles from where I lived on that lake where they go. And it was this, it was the period of where each one of those movies had a great song that went Yes. Out. Do you re do you remember that the year in 1969, the year that raindrops keep falling on my head? Do oh. you one. Well, that was the year that come Saturday morning yes. was up. What are you doing the rest of your life was up. You know, all those great songs. And they missed the one that I loved the best, which was Everybody's Talking at Me from Midnight Cowboy. Oh, my God. That I love John Schlesinger's Sunday Bloody Sunday blew me as a gay person, blew me out of the water. It was the first time I ever saw two men just kiss and really mean it, you know, and uh, it was a time we grew up in one of the greatest times in cinema history from like 1967 to 1975 before the blockbusters came in. A lot of really interesting films were happening and the, the censors were off. So things were raw and great. Ingmar Bergman was coming into town with, you know, cries and whispers and Fellini was coming into town. And, and do you remember? When during that time in the 70s, there were revival houses all over New York, and each one spec were, were specifically designed for a different kind of. You went to the Thalia to see, uh, you went to the Thalia to see film noir in the summer. You went to the for the MGM musicals. You went to the Regency, Regency. The hike down to Theater 80, where they you know to see them. I mean, all over town where you could see them on the big screen. You know, my first day in New York when I moved here. I came down here with $400 and I knew one person and I moved to New York and, and I was walking around my neighborhood. I live on 90 in the nineties and around, I came around the corner and there was the Thalia and it was the double bill of all about Eve and Laura. I spent the whole day there. I saw Laura three times and all about Eve twice. And I said, I'm never going, I'm home. I felt like Judy at Oz. I'm never going back. This is, this is it, you know? So, yeah. Well, yeah. I came to New York in 1979, so I came on the heels of all that. But when I discovered the Regency Movie Theater uh, and every uh, and these uh, film festivals every weekend, Saturdays and Sundays, I would go and I would stay all day. All day. All day. And they were good prints. And I remember, you know, at that time, a lot of the people that we loved in classic movies were still here. They were yes. in New York. They were walking the streets. And if you had an eye, you could see them. Now, my father was a hunter. And he taught me as a young man to be able to look up <laughs> any at any like field or forest and see a deer. I see a deer. I see a deer. I go, well, I, when I came to New York, I just applied that to <laughs> finding celebrities on the street and gay men at parties. And it worked out really well. So I remember having, I used to have talks with Joe Van Fleet. Joe oh my Fleet. God. And, you know, and I remember, I remember going to the Regency once and watching, sitting behind and watching Joe Van Fleet watch herself in her Oscar-winning role in East of Eden. Watch herself, and it was one of the most fascinating things. And she'd take her glasses out and lean forward and watch herself. You know, you know, and she finally looked like all those older women she played in the fifties when she, you know, won. You know, it was a great time. I went to the to I went to the. Um, I tell this story a lot. I, I, it's one of my favorites. I went to Radio City uh, one, one Tuesday. They had a summer where they were running all the original tried uh, many movies that had opened there, and they tried to get somebody in the movie to be there. And I read that they were showing The Greatest Show on Earth, Cecil B. DeMille, and Gloria Graham, who played the elephant girl, was going to was going to go and was going to introduce it. So I was, I've been in love with Gloria Graham. She's one of my top 10. Oh, mine favorite. too. Absolutely. Oh, God, I love her. So I raced over there. I got in there. I, 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 my eyes were adjusting. She was with Ted Hook. I saw her sit oh, down right, right behind her, right behind her. So she's sitting there and we're watching the movie. And by this time, she's this willowy little blonde. 
And on the screen, she's that sultry redhead, you know, gives, you know, when you, with all the sexual innuendos to Charlton Heston, you know, if you are a grumpy, you feel like biting somebody. Yeah. Well, pick your spot. You know, she was great. So <laughs> Jimmy Stewart would come on and she'd lean over to Ted Hook and she'd go, I love him. Oh, I don't, I love him. Then Charlton Heston came on and she said, oh, I love him. Oh, I love him. I love him. And then it came time for the elephant to put its hoof over her face. And she leaned over to, and she said, do you know that really made me do that? <laughs> and she said, well, why did you do it? She said, are you kidding to be in a DeMille movie? And I only got the part because Lucille Ball got pregnant. <laughs> Oh my God! And well, I thought to myself, oh, "This is why I live in New York." For me, that's heaven. That was absolute heaven. Oh my God! There was—I mean, do you remember Harold Kennedy used to do? Uh, they Harold, uh, Harold Kennedy, yeah. Yes, yeah. Uh, I mean, th but there were all of these incredible uh, movie tributes and everything. And I, I, I met Gloria Swanson. Um, I went to, one afternoon when. Um, Joan Fontaine's book came out, No Bed of Roses. No Bed of Roses. And she came out on stage and she said, I will talk about anything and answer any questions except I'll about my it. sister. And the first woman stood up and said, who is your sister? And she walked off the stage and she grabbed all the flowers that were all over the stage. She picked up all the flowers and she walked down and she handed them to this woman. <laughs> and she said, I'm taking you to dinner tonight. <laughs> That's the best. That's and I will never forget this. And, every, and this woman's going, who is her sister? Who is her sister? And if anyone out there watching this does not know who her sister is, go and get the book. <laughs> yes. Olivia de Hackhand. Yes. Oh, my God. I want to tell everybody, we are going to give actually away two tickets to your show. Oh, and nice. I want to say, I pulled up this. I, you know, the word for today is competence. And I pulled up this word because it's the ability to do something successfully or efficiently. And that's you because you are so good at what you do. And I, I, you know, I just absolutely love everything that you do. And I, you know, and this is how you're all going to uh, get a chance to win two tickets. And if you're outside of New York and you can't be there, um, you know, still enter and I will send you a, uh, do you have a favorite book about Alfred Hitchcock? About Alfred Hitchcock? Yes. Oh, yeah. There's one out. There's one out called Hitchcock's Ladies. It's by Donald Spotto. It's really, really good. And it tells about his relationship with all of his leading ladies that he had, you know, and how he worked with actors or didn't work with actors. So, uh, yeah, I like that one a lot. That's a good one. So if for any reason that we have a winner that cannot be in New York uh, to go and see your show, uh, then uh, we will, you know, get that book for them instead. Uh, oh, how's that? Uh, okay. But we're hoping that somebody will be able to, uh, you know, win the tickets that's in New York. Now, I always like to start the shows with a random question. I pulled a random question that I have not even looked at yet. Yes, I'm single. And yes, I'm okay, <laughs> okay. And uh, well, uh, well, since you've answered that question, this is a great question. This is a random question. Okay. What's the most embarrassing thing that's ever happened to you during a date? The most embarrassing thing that ever happened to me during a date. Oh, um, I was, uh, this was when I was in high school and I was, it was my, it was my first prom and I was going to pick my then, you know, this, this lovely girl up and my mother, uh, my mother, um, Oh no no no! This is that that I felt what well, that when I fell on the rose and I broke her rose and I handed her a broken rose. No, the <laughs> the fun, the worst thing I ever did, or the funniest thing. This is the funniest thing that ever happened. My mother used to have to drive me on dates, and so I wanted to see Gone with the Wind. It was the first date I ever went on, so I got this girl, and the whole way up, my mother is saying to me, 
You gotta kiss. You gotta kiss with girls like Clark Gable. You pay attention when we get in that theater. Watch how Clark Gable kisses Vivian Lee. That's how you're supposed to kiss a girl. You don't, don't be namby pamby and kiss her like Clark Gable. So I'm okay, okay, okay. So I go to watch Gone with the Wind, and this girl couldn't have been less interested in me. In fact, when we low in to leave her off home, she jumped out of the car before we got the car stopped in front of her house. <laughs> and, and my mother and my mother's lecturing me all the way home. You're just not fast enough. That's the problem. You're just not fast enough. So years <laughs> later, uh, years later, I said to her once. Uh, you know, Mom, you were right about a lot of things. And I said, one of the things you were right was you told me once that I should kiss like Clark Gable. She said, yes, by God, you should. I said, yes. And every man I ever kissed, I kissed just like Clark Gable. <laughs> 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 oh, I didn't mean that. She's <laughs> and what was her response? Oh, oh, she, oh, oh. I, 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 you know, she would get like Mary Bowler. She would just sputter. <laughs> So, you know, I, I asked, you know, before we started, I asked for a photograph of you uh, okay. as a five-year-old. Okay. And you sent a picture of you with your, I think it's, this is your sister. My sister. I'm going to pull this up. Here you are. Here I love are. this picture. And look at the two of you. You look the same. Uh, oh, honey. You're so nice, boy. Are you no, I love this picture. And there's, I, and I always ask for the five-year-old self because the five-year-old self to me is the purest self. It's before life begins telling you who you should be or who you should not be. And I want to know a, bit, a little bit about this five-year-old boy and uh, the life that you were living. And uh, what movies were you watching at five years old? Old ones. NBC Saturday night at the movies. In fact, my mother used to blackmail me with it. She would, she would, I was, and anything, my mother was like an actress without a vehicle. She was like, and she looked to me at that time in the 50s like Susan Hayward. Uh, and so Susan Hayward mm -hmm. became my favorite actress. Mm -hmm. I would watch her. And Saturday Night at the Movies would show those big Technicolor Fox. Oh, movies. yeah. Garden of Evil and President's Lady and all those. And so I would watch those. But the movie that I was obsessed with when I was a kid, and she really blackmailed me with this one, was Barbara Stanwyck and Clifton Webb in Titanic. And she would, it still makes me cry. I watched it the other I night. I just watched it the other night. Oh, oh, it's still, they are, their chemistry is so good. And the, it won the screenplay award for best original screenplay. It was, it was so good. And, and it's, for those of you who haven't seen it, uh, I reviewed it on Title Queen at the movies. It's a fictional story set against the disaster. They don't get everything right, mm -hmm. but you get the feeling of it. And it has such great, and Thelma Ritter plays the unsinkable Molly Brown character. Yes. And uh, Richard Basehart plays an alcoholic priest who's been thrown out of Rome. And I mean, it's just, it's so good. And that's what I watched. So I, I had a great imagination and I used to play all those movies. I'd watch them on Saturday night. Then I'd get all my friends together and we would play hard and play them. Cause I was in the country. I was in a small town in the country. So we had lots of farmland and hills and pastures and woods to run through. So that's what I did. And I, and in fact, a friend of mine who, <laughs> my dear friends, who was my roommate in college said, uh, you know, the first time I ever saw you, I walked into the cafeteria and you were over in the corner and you had a rapt audience and you were telling the story of Titanic <laughs> <laughs> in college. So, <laughs> so where did you grow up, Steve? Uh, a little town called New Woodstock, which is about 35 miles southeast of Syracuse. I grew up in Madison County. It's central New York State. It's the heart, the heart of the snow belt. You know, we mm -hmm. got it coming down from Montreal. We got it coming across from the Great Lakes. So we got pelted. And my, I lived in a two-story house. My father was the town plumber. My father had grown up. I was the fourth generation in that town. Um, and I remember we... We in the '60s we had those little vinyl snowsuits, and what, we'd get these blizzards, and we'd have huge snowbanks, ten feet up to the my bedroom window. And my mother would put me in the snowbank and lift up the window and say, "You get to do this once." And she'd put me on top of the snowbank, and I got to slide down into the street. You know, we it was it was great, and all my friends were farm kids. I had you know, and I went to from kindergarten right all the way through, and yeah. then I, I ended up I went to Casanova High School. And then I ended up teaching college at Casanova. And then um, I moved to New York because I just, I had to. Well, as you were going through high school, uh, what were your aspirations? What were the goals that you had? Where did you imagine yourself being, let's say, 
five years after graduation from high school. My main thing in high school was survival. I just was so afraid that of being picked on because I knew I was gay. So I be, people found me funny. So I was the class clown and I worked mm -hmm. every day at that. That was my main thing. So I was performing every day. I would get home at night and go, <sighs> they didn't find out today. Um, up until then, I wanted to be a comic strip artist for the newspapers. That's what I wanted to do. But then I got the acting bug. I had had a, I had a beautiful little boy soprano and my mother at the drop of a hat would make me get up and sing. Mm -hmm. So I had been singing and performing since oh, eight or nine years old. I was always getting up and singing. And singing. So I got the acting bug. We did musicals and I, I, I applied to one school, <laughs> the local community college, and I got in. I got rejected in every art school I applied to except the one I did for theater. So that's where I went. And, um, and it turned out to be great because we had this really wonderful guy who was the head of the theater department who was, sort of, he was crazy. He was a madman, but he, he ran the theater department for two years and he was determined to give you a four year complete theater education in two years. So we worked our butts off. And by the end of two years, I was ready to come to New York. So. So when you made the decision that you were going to come to New York, what was the response that you got from your family? Well, they, well the response I always got from my family, which was they didn't know what to make of me. They Welcome really, to my world. Yeah. You know, I mean, I was, uh, my father was this, was that renowned guy in town. He was the, the best hunter and fisherman and tough guy growing up. He was the fighter in town. And, and I was just, you know, I just, <laughs> My sister was tough and played sports and everything. And, and I wanted to, you know, I wanted Barbies and, you know, I, not to be stereotypical, but the, and I, no, was, what, I, no. I was singing, I was buying Sondheim shows and I didn't even know what the shows were. And I would play the soundtracks and memorize every single song company. I would, you know, I would be walking around singing, you know, company all day long. And um, so when I finally came out, I thought, well, you know, it's too small an area to subject my parents. To Did that. you come out there? I came out there. Yeah, I, I came out. I was driving to Syracuse and going to gay bars. And I just decided that uh, there was a show on. They had, remember when they used to have ABC movie of the weeks, mm -hmm. right? And one of them was with Hal Holbrook and Martin Sheen. And it was called That Certain Summer. Ah, oh, yeah, I remember. Remember that? Mm -hmm. And it was about a young boy who his father's having a gay affair. And I had my parents watch that. My mother watched that. And then they, my mother just couldn't accept it. She, it was, it, she just, it was the great burden of her life. You know? yes. so, and my father, I didn't want him to have that thrown in his face, you know? So I moved to New York. I just got out of, I just got out of their way and I moved to New York and I never looked back. I love New York as much as the very first day I ever said it. And I still oh, think same here. I, well, you and I have, you know, uh, a lot in common, but uh, we, uh, I came to New York, $500 in my pocket. I didn't know anyone. When you came here, uh, where did you go uh, when you first got here? Well, where I had, I had, I was working. Um, I, I had uh, an ex roommate who moved to New York and he was gorgeous. And he came to New York and he was like a star as soon as he hit town. Everybody wanted him. A lot of them had him. And he, you know, and he just, he got me a job at the Candlewood Theater in, in Connecticut. And they brought in star packages. So I worked mm -hmm. backstage there and I became friends with the stage manager. And I told him I wanted to move to New York. And he said, well, I have to stay up at this theater for at least a month and a half after the season's done. Why don't you come and you can have, be in my apartment until you find a place to stay. And I moved, I, I came to New York. I had a place. My friend got me a job at a gay bar on, on 80th and 3rd Avenue called Harry's Back East. And mm -hmm. that's where I worked. And, um, and, and I just, um, I, I, I moved into, I, when it was time for me to get my own apartment, I moved into the apartment next door and I'm still here 45 years later. I'm Same apartment. Here. Yep. Was it an easy transition uh, coming into New York for you? Did you feel that you had found exactly where you were? I knew where I should be. I, I came in here and I loved everything about it. The business of show business was daunting to me. I've never been a good auditioner. 
I never, I, I doing the rounds and doing that whole thing was agony for me. For some reason, though, I, I met up with this wonderful actress and we decided, and I knew I was funny and I could write material for her and I wrote material for us. And we just, we started uh, Bruce Hopkins and Earl wow. They discovered me and I started, they discovered us rather. And I started doing my comedy act at the old duplex in the village. And all of a sudden, everything I got subsequently for my entire career has come out of cabaret. I owe cabaret everything. Cabaret no, it's greatest, cabaret month. So it's that's the greatest training ground in the, in the whole world. It is. It's just, I learned. And at that time, cabaret was wonderful because it was, um, it was experimental. So you could do sort of experimental different things. And the first review that we ever got was in Variety. And they raved about us and said that we were the next Nichols and May. Mm. And that did a lot for us. And and uh, then uh, we ended that, that we parted company. And then we, I started out on my own. And, by, and I opened, um, thanks to Irv, I opened Don't Tell Mamas. I opened it with Karen Mason. I was the opening act for Karen Mason and Brick Hartney was the opening act for Nancy Lamont. And we switched every other night. We were the very first people to play Don't Tell Mamas. So I opened Don't Tell Mamas. And, um, and then from there, it's just been one thing after another, you know, and Can that's you describe happened. for those who are watching what that world was like at that point, because I remember the first time that I went to Don't Tell Mama when it was one piano uh when it was the one cabaret room uh and it was the piano bar in the front uh and it was i lived for a short while on 47th street i always used to say if i could walk right through the back wall of delta mama i could walk into my apartment uh because it but it was a neighborhood bar yeah and everybody knew each other but everybody was, hung out it was a they, different vibe and they were three bars see so it was the duplex don't tell mamas and brandies and yes. they all shared. And then they opened 88s and they were all under the Irv Rabel, Rob Hoskins group. And we all came out of there. Ruby rims right now, Ruby rims inherited Irv Rabel's posters that he designed for all those acts. And he's been posting them every day on Facebook. And it's a wonderful, you should watch. It's a great tribute back. You just see all these faces that you haven't seen in years. You know, of course, many of the, of those wonderful people, are gone, you know, because of AIDS. And, you know, that was the, that was one of the great tragedies, but it was a really fun group and you could go from one club to another. I'd play the duplex and then maybe I'd go and I'd do 88s. I never did brandies. I, I made guest spots at brandies, but, and then I played a lot at uh, 88s when I did trick, as a matter of fact, uh, the song that I sing in trick, my, my musical number was the last thing performed at 88s before it closed they they shot that that number so yeah those were it was a great time and a lot of great people came out of it a lot of great people there's trick and uh how did trick come along and all of a sudden there you are uh this person who loves the movies to see yourself on the screen what <laughs> yeah it was uh i uh, jim fall who directed trick i used to uh at the time his friend his uh ex was matt berman and Matt Berman used to light all my shows, and Jim used to come. Matt to Berman uh, helped me. Uh, Matt Berman oh. is my savior. He's God. my lighting guy. And the, and the cutest. He and Jim, the cutest. So uh, Jim used to come to see my shows. Well, Jim came and approached me and said, I have a screenplay we're doing readings of. Would you, there's a part in that I think you'd be right for. So I said, okay. And I did 10 readings of Trick. And when they went to make the movie, uh, they wanted a star in my in my part. And Jim said, and I kind of knew that was going to happen. And Jim said to me, look, come in, knock it out of the park. I'm voting for you, but they want a name. And I said, I, I know that. So um, I went in and uh, and I did a great, it was one of the few times I did a great audition. I killed. And I remember Jim Fall turning to the producers and saying, ladies and gentlemen, that's comedy pointing to me and I left. And then I had written a musical, co-written a musical called Kiss Me Quick Before the Lava Reaches the Village. <laughs> and it was being done at the at the uh at Issaquah at the Village Theater in Issaquah out in, in um Seattle. So I was out there getting ready to mount that show, mount that musical. And they called up and Jim said, you know what? We tested a lot of different people and we we videotaped every single reading we did of this and nobody can see anybody in that part but you. 
So I think Coco and I were the two that that yes. went all the way through. And um, and I was just lucky, you know. You know, I'll tell you something. And, and I thought about this the night I heard it. I went to see years ago to see Gregory Peck do his one-man show up in New Haven. He would come out and he was dressed as Atticus Finch. And he would answer questions from the audience for two hours, you know. And at one point they said, some woman said, uh, why do you think you got that Oscar for To Kill a Mockingbird and you didn't get it for the other things you've been nominated for? You know, and he said, I really don't know, except I think sometimes in this business, it's just your turn. And the hardest thing you'll ever have is waiting for your turn to come and grabbing it when it comes. And I thought that was what happened with Trick. It was my, it was just my turn and I got it. And it was great. And it was a wonderful experience. Um, unfortunately. Well, let me ask you a question about that. When you are auditioning for this and they're telling you, you, you have this idea that they're looking for a name. Does that take a little bit of the edge off of you that you feel I'm just going to go through? I, I know that you wanted it. And no, because I just knew, you know, I went in and I had done this part so much. I thought they're either going to go for this or they're not. I'm going to give it my all. I'm going to give them my very best shot. And they're either going to, they're either going to go for it or they're not. Um, I've had other things where I went in and I was intimidated by what, you know, uh, by, by the circumstances and it affected me, you know, but on that particular occasion, I had done that part enough. So I didn't, I didn't have any doubts that I could do it if they would give it to me. It was all whether or not they were they were going to go with me, and they went with me. So I was very I was very fortunate. How did things change for you after the film came out, or did they? <laughs> well, uh, initially it was great because um, I a lot of people saw it. I and I I couldn't believe how many people saw it. I got on a plane about a week after it opened, or two weeks after it opened. I got a plane for my first trip to London, and. Um, the steward came up and bent down by me and said, I know who you are. <laughs> and I said, oh, okay. So <laughs> and, we, and I was with my ex at the time and, and, a, and a dear friend. And we, we were in front of our hotel in, uh, where we were staying in London. And we were about to walk in. And I heard, ah! And I turned around. And these two guys are across the street. And they're singing, Como te gusta mi pinga? Across the street. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. And I was just and jumping up and down and pointing and jumping up and down. And my ex turned to my friend under it, just under his breath, and said, This is not good. This is not good. <laughs> so initially, and then since that time, since that time, it's been wonderful because it was a really it was a really, really seminal movie for a lot of people. It helped a lot of people come out. And I can't tell you how many times people have stopped me. And it's always wonderful. Stopped me on the street and told me that they loved what I did and that they loved Trick. Oh, you are so wonderful in this film. I love you in this film. Oh, well, I thank love you. The, I, I love, love the film. I love the film. It's got a great message. And it and it and it's all of, it's like, it's kind of like an old fashioned romantic comedy from the forties, which I really love, you know, uh, um, but it also, it really captures what it was like at that time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it does. It does. And, uh, and the leads are sweet. The actors were great. It was, it's got a terrific cast. It was just, and it's romantic. It's so ro sweet and romantic. I'll tell you, I was, uh, this is after I did title quit at the movies. I've been doing it about five years and, um, I was walking down the street and I passed this great big tall guy, you know, like in his twenties, but you know, he was all all tattooed and all pierced and, you know, and kind of rugged. And, and he passed me and he bumped me. And I'm, I'm in Chelsea and walking all of a sudden I feel like, oh, somebody's behind me. I turn around and he's looming over me. And I went, hi. And he went, are you the tired old queen at the movies? <laughs> <laughs> said, yes, I are. And he said, were you in track? Were you in track? I said, I was indeed. He said, oh, I love you. <laughs> oh, my God. I just love, love it. Love that. 
I, and he was Mr. Bear of night in America. Mr. He would come to New York to get his trophy. He was Mr. Bear of gay bear America of that year. And he said, uh, he said will you come to the stone wall and see me get my award? You know, I said, well, I don't know, but is that sweet? I thought that was so sweet. Oh my God. I love it. Well, I want to talk about something else that you've done. And a, a few years ago, I was very lucky because they, um, a dear friend of mine, Peggy Eason, who just recently passed away, she gave me a wonderful gift, and that was the TCM backlot as a gift. And as soon as I get it, I find out they're having a contest. I enter the contest. I sent a screen test to TCM, and they accepted it. And I was flown out to California uh, for the film festival, and I presented Jezebel. Oh. Uh, at the uh, Turner Classic Movie Film Festival in Hollywood, uh, which was thrill of a lifetime. Oh. Uh, I was there when across the street, they were presenting uh, In the Heat of the Night with Lee Grant and Sidney Poitier. And I was like, I was like, I want to go over there because I was dying to meet Sidney Poitier uh, and Lee Grant, uh, one of my favorite films. And but you have been a guest programmer. Uh, I'm going to pull up a, a, a photograph of you and Robert Osborne. Uh, but talk about the experience of being a guest programmer. And you know, there you are. I love this. And what that experience has been like for you as well. Well, um, my, that was part of my team. I have a wonderful team that helps me with Title Queen at the movies. And my. Uh, Tom Meacham, who edits and shot my stuff, he saw this. Um, he saw this contest that they were taking on uh, for programmers for the 20th anniversary of TCM, and he sent one of my episodes. In fact, it was the episode for King's Row. Um, oh, yeah. And he sent my episode in, and they accepted it. And I found this out in December, and they flew me down. Um, and it was my birthday, January 12th. I flew to Atlanta to shoot this thing. And there were 19 of us of all ages and sexes and different backgrounds and race, colors, creeds. We were all movie fans. We had that. And, you know, we were all just dying. We were all talking the talk. It was so great. You know, Maria Uspenskaya, Gail Sondergaard, E. Martin. You know, we were talking the talk. Quotes, movie quotes, lines. It was so much fun. So then um, they came to me and they said, they had asked me to submit a list of movies that I felt I could talk about. And I did ones, I did films that I thought I could do a little imitation if I would Osborne, if I could do. And they said, we would like you to introduce them. Now them is that 1953 science fi fiction movie about giant ants in the desert. Yes, there it is. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and so they said, well, how do you feel about introducing them? I said, like a family reunion on my mother's side, giant ants, little uncles, and my cousin screaming in terror. I said, it's not a problem at all. So we, Robert, because I had had experience doing title quit at the movies, Robert Osborne didn't really have to pull me along. We got, we got along like a house on fire. And I did my J I, you know, I did my imitation of Edmund Gwynn, you know, and, mm -hmm. and he did. And, and I told him about the, we talked about James Whitmore and that whole thing. And he was charming. and oh, lovely. Yeah. What a gentleman. And when he talked with you, he would um, he would talk right to you. Right into and, your and, eyes. And, yes. And the whole time you were his focus of his attention. And then someone would come over here and he'd go, excuse me. Yes. Okay. Great. Boom. Back to you. So you felt so special. I had I had his Academy Awards history book next to my bed for 45 years. I'd gotten it in 1969 and I took it down and had him sign it. And he, we went out to lunch. He said, would you like to have lunch with me? And I said, yes, yes. So we went to the commissary, everybody and me had lunch. And, and he talked about Gene Tierney and I asked him about Susan Hayward and we had a wonderful time. Um, I'll tell you a funny story though. We went, a bunch of us, there were 10, they shot 10 a day. So the first day they shot 10 and we, I was on the second day. So they took us to, oh, they took us to the aquarium and then they took us to the Coca-Cola factory and stuff. So we're, but we're all, you know, okay, that's nice. That's nice. We're driving along and all of a sudden the, the bus stops at a red light and this little Southern girl says to us, ladies and gentlemen, if you'll take a moment, just for a moment, if you look on the right is the home of Margaret Mitchell who wrote Gown with the Wind. I stood up and went, Stop this bus! 
<laughs> we, <laughs> 10 of us screaming movie fans jumped off this bus we hit that gift shop like piranhas to a dead cow i swear we cleaned it out in five minutes and we're doing we're all doing we're all talking the lines you know we're talking like crazy like you know oh scarlet i don't give it a, you know this i told you told you you know we were it was so funny it was so funny i said yeah this is where you should have taken us first first you know <laughs> so then so uh, since then um you know it's been it's just been great I, I you know he he was a charming wonderful man Robert. I only met him once I I I was very fortunate to have as a dear friend uh uh March Champion was a good friend of mine uh, and uh, uh, there was a, they did a little uh, short documentary I don't know if you saw it with her and Donald Sadler uh -huh. and uh she uh and I was at the premiere for that and he was there and she introduced me to him so that was the only time that I ever met him Oh. And uh, I well, regret. I, I I met him on a couple of social occasions, and he was always charming. And um, I I inter I made him tell a story about um, you know, about Susan Hayward. You know, the the dolls that I have in the back are all by, they're Jean dolls. They're by Mel, my dear friend and artist Mel Odom. And uh, I, I told him when I was growing up that I was Barbie deprived because my parents wouldn't let me have a Barbie doll. So he started giving me his jean doll. So I've, I've just got a bunch of them and I use them as props. They're like three to me. They're like three dimensional George Shirell <laughs> costumes, you know, so I always put them in my episodes. But I made him tell when I when I saw Robert Osborne, I was with Mel and I made him tell the story about uh, Susan Hayward that. Um, that uh, he had a friend, he, he knew her from Backstreet. He was friendly with uh, Ross Hunter. And they were on the set of Backstreet, which was the, the 10th anniversary episode I did on Tired Oaking the Movies. And he said he had a dear friend of his, Osborne did, that um, loved Susan Hayward. And he wanted to see if he could set up a luncheon with her and him for a birthday, a surprise birthday. So he went to, Rob, to Ross Hunter and said, do you think she'd go with this? And he said, yeah, I think she would go for it. Let's go. She's in her trailer. Let's go ask her. So they go over and they lay the whole thing out. And Susan Hayward goes, why not? You know, so, so they, they go, okay. So I mean, he said he went to his friend. He, he couldn't keep a secret. And he went to his friend. He said, boy, are you having a birthday party this year? He said, what? He said, I've got a big surprise. And he said, what? And he said to his friend, you're going to have lunch with Susan Hayward. And his friend went, no, I'm not. He said, yes, you are. You're going to have lunch with Susan Hayward. He went, I can't. And he said, why not? And the friend said, it's Susan Hayward. When I meet her, if she doesn't slap me across the face, I won't believe it's Susan Hayward. I can't do that. And he didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, so silly sometimes. Uh, it reminds me of a great... I did a show years ago with an actress named Anne-Marie Himmelsbach. Isn't that a great name? Yes, yes. And she was first cousins with Joanne Woodward, who just had a birthday. And she was coming to New York, and she was going to have lunch with Joanne Woodward. And she said, whatever you do, do not fawn over her, because she does not like that kind of attention. Um, if you talk about her films and everything, that's fine, but just do not fawn over her. She said, okay, I promise I will be fine. So they're in the restaurant. Uh, Joanne Woodward walks in and she goes, oh my God, oh my God, I can't believe it. I can't believe it's Joanne. And she's going, please don't do this to me. Whatever you do, do not do this to me. She comes to the table and she goes, Miss Woodward, I am such a fan of yours and your husband. What's his name? What's his name? And Joanne Woodward says, any woman who refers to my husband as what's his name is a friend in my book. Yes, yes. That's so great. So, you know, uh, I am, you know, I am going to do this. I'm going to bring up on the screen, as I said, here it is. The word for today is competence because you've got it. And uh, I, this is my homage to James Lipton inside the actor's studio. I've got some questions that I'm going to ask you. Uh, just to round up today. Okay. And uh, and this gives everyone a chance to use hashtag competence uh, for a chance to win tickets to your show uh, or uh, the book that we'll give out in case they're not in New York. And the first question is, um, uh, are you a pet person? Do you no. have pets? No. Have no. you ever had pets? I did. I, I raised miniature schnauzers. I raised little dogs when I was growing up and we had, we had a lot of dogs, but it was in the country. And I didn't, 
I wanted to have the freedom to come and go as I pleased and didn't want to, I didn't think it was fair. So for myself, pets didn't work. I love them, but I can't have them. Oh, okay. And what was the most satisfying display of instant karma that you have ever experienced? <laughs> well, it's funny. It's funny. I was walking down because it wasn't my karma. It was my my ex's. I was walking down the street. And I my ex and I had broken up, and I hadn't seen him in a long time. And I had for I I for some reason I dyed my hair. I'd never done it before, and it was supposed to be light brown, and it came out jet black like Bella Lugosi. <laughs> and I was I couldn't get it out. And I was walking down the street, and here who's coming down the street but my ex coming right towards me. So I thought if I put my head down like this, they're not going to see it. And just as just as I'm passing, I look up like this. And as I'm passing, he says, I loved you and Rebecca. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my God. That is so funny. Oh, that is great. I just love that. That is wonderful. Um. What is the biggest thing that you've ever stolen? I'm not really a thief. I'm not, <laughs> I, I'm not, I, I, I feel too guilty. I was raised with too much guilt. I always think I'm in the wrong. I'm always the first to apologize, especially when I haven't done anything. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know. That's a, I, call, I guess I stole... Oh, I this recently I I was at a bookstore, an old bookstore. It was a secondhand bookstore, and I opened up a, a movie star's biography, and their New York Times obituary fell out of the book, and I pocketed it. Oh, uh, who was the obituary? Cary Grant. Wow, wow. Um, what experience in your career has made you the wisest? Um, I, the, the things that are supposed to make me the wisest, I don't always think that they have made me wise because I, I, I keep, the, the wisdom only comes when you don't make the same mistakes again. But, um, I, I'm not great with the business end of show business and I've learned the hard way and I've lost things and I've had things happen and, um, a few times and but i think everybody in this business has a, one or two horror stories that we had to go through to learn mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. and hopefully i've learned enough to keep myself okay but um yeah those are hard those mm -hmm. are hard things because it's about uh it's it's about, i accept the fact that when people get uh things that i don't but i i i don't i don't always believe that there are people who are just really evil nasty people and they do exist in our business. They exist everywhere, but they do exist in our business. And I've met uh, you. You can say that again. I experienced, it, I experienced it this week. Um, uh, what was the best question that you ever asked that propelled you forward in your career? What time does the next Amtrak to New York leave? <laughs> Good for you. That's great. Um, what is the most satisfying thing that you do each day or week? Most satisfying thing I do each day or week? God, I don't want to sound too humble. I don't want to sound like a goody goody. But I, I get up every single morning and I thank God for another day. That's and wonderful. I just say, show me what I need to do. I and love that. And just let me, let me keep going. Let me just, let me not be, the only, a friend of mine once said to me that the only time fear wins is when we allow it to paralyze us. If we show up despite our fear, we've beaten it. God bless so you. So I always hope that I'm going to be able to show up despite my fear because I'm always afraid of everything. Wow. That's just wonderful. the way I was raised. So 
and, and it you. has kept me in a business where I, I really don't know how I do it, you know, sometimes, you know, and right now, especially I'm always, it's always about reinventing yourself. You know, I'm at a stage now where I, this is the, I don't know what, what, what's going to happen to me next. I've got a big birthday coming up next year and, and, um, you know, I, I, I don't know where I belong, but I'm finding out I'm, I'm trying to figure it out and technology overwhelms me. And when I feel stupid, I get like, like those test patterns at the end of TV stations. Mm -hmm. In. Can I put a couple plugs in right now? Is that okay? Oh, absolutely. All right. I'll, I'll, I'll hold those plugs for a few moments. I'm going to give you a chance to give those plugs in. Okay. okay. So maybe you've answered this next question. I'm going to give you the chance to do the plugs at the end. But, That's uh, all right. That's uh, all right. That's what do you not like doing? What do I not like doing? Um. I, I don't like hurting people's feelings. I, I, I just am always afraid I've hurt somebody's feelings mm. and I don't, I will do. And it's, and I'm not saying that this is a plus this, that this is a positive thing. I will do almost anything not to have a confrontation of some kind. I just, I wasn't raised that way. I wish I had been, I wish I was raised in a house where people yelled and had arguments and, and learned how to speak you know, have arguments and do it. And I, I don't, I'm always just too afraid of that, that I'm stepping on someone's toes or hurting someone's feelings. Mm -hmm. And it, it hasn't, it's, it's been a bane of my existence really in a lot of ways, but I just, at, you know, you get to a certain point in your life and you go, okay, some things are going to be able to work on and some things are just here for the run. And that's the way it is. So I'm a lot more gentle with myself now at this stage of my life than I ever was when I was younger. I never thought I was doing enough. I never, I try to live more in the moment, in the present each day and not project on the future or reflect too much on the past. I just, I just try to take it one day at a time, one day at a time. Wow. And sometimes um, that works and sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> what would you find hardest about being in prison? Being in prison. <laughs> and my last question, what scares you the most about this profession that you're in what what say that again what scares you the most about the future of this profession about the future of the profession yes what scares me the most about about humanity in general that we're getting so lost in technology that we're losing face-to-face -face communication with with each other feelings and touching and communication you know, we just watch these screens and everything's given to us and we just we become a, a, ton of, a ton of toms, you know, a ton of, I don't know the word, I'm, you know, automatrons that we're just, yes. that we're, we're, we're losing touch with humanity. And I think that that's a problem. And I also think it's, I think, and this is, I'm going to be proud of probably saying this, but when did movies stop being entertainment? Right. I'm really tired of all these cause movies. Everything's got a cause. Right. Movies, you know, these disease movies of the week, these traumas movies of the week. I, I'm I, angst, I, angst, angst, angst. Everything, everything. The movies this year were so bleak. They were so bleak right across the board, you know? And I I really want, and I, you know, in the depression or whatever, they had movies that entertainment, entertainment, you know? Um, and even, I don't know, I just, I just, think that we need to we need more movies that entertain i think you know we need and more of you message, steve. and have a good human humane message at the same time and, and we're going to give a, uh, and fun. since you're all about entertainment we're going to give away two tickets and we're going to show you how this works my <sighs> hands are here so you see that i have nothing to do with picking the winner are these people and who signed up james johnson james. is our winner uh james uh just uh uh He's been a winner before. So, James, if you're not able to be in New York, let me know. Uh, just private message me after the show, um, and uh, we will go from there. Uh, Steve, I'm going to give you a, a chance to uh, get those plugs in in a moment. Uh, but uh, before we get there, uh, I want to thank everybody uh, for showing up today. Uh, I know that I can speak for Steve when I say this. We don't take it lightly when you show up. Uh, so thank you all for thank showing you. up today. Um, if this is your first time here, I hope it won't be your last. 
please subscribe to Richard Skipper Celebrates and check out the other artists that I've celebrated here. We surpassed 400 episodes uh, just recently. Uh, so please check them out. Uh, leave a comment here on YouTube and share this with your friends. Let other people know about this channel. Uh, I'm all about celebrating. I'm about celebrating art, and you're celebrating really artists. Thank you. Celebrating each and every other person. Um, I also end every show by telling everyone to go out and do something nice for somebody else without expecting anything in return. Uh, as I said, the word for today is competence. Uh, and that's something within each and every one of us. Show up, do the best job that you can possibly be. Uh, and if you show up, that's being competent. Yes. Show up, believe, and let's support each other instead of tearing each other apart. Uh, which there's too much of that going on right now. Yep. Uh, and also go to your Facebook friends list uh, and then pull up the third name that pops up on your friends list and reach out with a phone call. Not an email message, not a text message, not a private inbox message, but a phone call. And let that person know what they mean to you. Uh, because as our dear friend uh, David Friedman always says, we're all in this together but we're not in the same boat. And I always say, if you're going to go out in a boat, make sure you bring a skipper along. And if I you always say, if you're going to go out in a boat, bring a dress because no dress, no lifeboat. That's what I learned from Titanic. That's right. <laughs> and uh, Or call me later and I'll tell you what Carol Channing had to say about Tallulah Bankhead oh. on a lifeboat. So anyway, uh, Steve, I want to leave the screen. And I'm going to give you the final word to, uh, to say anything that you want about anything that we talked about today that you want to build upon, anything that we didn't talk about that you wish we had, and the chance to plug away at anything that you want to talk about. Uh, and of course, uh, mention uh, the information for your show. And I will have all the details uh, posted on YouTube as well. Thank so you. on how people can get tickets that didn't win tickets today. So uh and I'm going to do my best to be there at Pangea uh, to cheer you on. Uh, because after all, you are Hitch. And I can't wait to be there. I love you, Steve. Thanks for being love here you today. Too, and thank you thank very you. much. And don't worry about how to end the show. As soon as you say goodbye, the final credits will roll. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just want to once again plug my uh, Hitchcock show. And uh, it's going to once again be at Pangea on April the 10th at 7 p.m. And if you go to Pangea uh, NYC at uh, Pangea NYC dot, uh, com, you can order tickets for that. I would also like to put in a plug for a, an organization that I'm a part of that I love called the Episcopal Actors Guild, which gives money and food and help to people in the profession, actors, and um, they do great stuff. You should find out about them. We've been around for 75 years. We do great, great, great stuff for actors. And you can find that at actorsguild.org. And I'd also like to put a plug in for my YouTube show, Steve Hayes, Tired Old Queen of the Movies. Please tune in. Our newest episode is on Paris Blues with Joanne Woodward, Paul Newman, Cindy Poitier, and Diane Carroll, and directed by Martin Ritt. And I've got two Facebook pages. I'd love to Facebook you. And we talk about movies every day. And I want to thank Richard for having me on the show. It's been such a pleasure. And thank you, folks, for tuning in. You're just the best. And uh, happy spring. Take care. Bye-bye.